Alito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. I would assume there's so much trial and error in any attempt to bring an evolving landscape back to its natural and traditional environment. So what things have you tried and what do you think worked and and hasn't worked? We've done a lot of trial and error. It's really complex and it depends on your local ecosystem. So something that may work for somebody in another part of the state may not work here. So it it does require trial and error. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got 220 native grass and forb species, wildflowers, growing on our land. So we we had to come up with a technique that wasn't going to destroy all those to introduce the few species that are still missing. Um, we tried lots of different things, but the one that we found to be the most effective was we have wild hogs here. And, you know, they, oh. they root and they tear up the land. So we'd go to a place where they'd rooted and rake it over to get it all smooth and then throw a bunch of prairie seeds out there and just barely cover it. And that was more effective than anything else we tried. Um, Seed bombs, for example, are something that we thought had a lot of promise, but we spent many hours putting those together and had a really low germination rate. So based on, on that, we started doing the technique where we'd go out with a garden hoe, make basically a mini pig rooting area, and then plant the seeds there out in different strategic areas in our pastures. This last year we did um, some controlled burns and we're using techniques that the Nature Conservancy uses. You burn an area and then you burn it in the fall or in the winter and then you scatter the seeds on the bare or lightly covered ground and then the next spring you move the animals in there to knock down the vegetation that's existing and then you move them off for a long time and that gives all the new seeds a chance to grow. So that's the technique that seems to be having the most success. Fascinating. With the prairie plants, it takes them, you know, three years after germination to really start to show up. So we'll know for sure in another two years, but it seems mm-hmm. to have the most promise. Yeah, and there, you mentioned before that there were three uh, response types on the land. What are those three types? Well, for us, you know, the best response is areas that, as we've changed the management, they've come back up in native prairie with lots of different species, deeply rooted plants, plants that are palatable to the animals. Some areas have been more damaged. You know, they're still covered in native plants, but they're missing some species. You know, they may have three dozen species instead of a hundred species growing there. And then the areas Mm -hmm. that are in the worst shape are the ones where previous landowners planted it in Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, These are invasive grasses. Um, They're planted because they can stand a lot of abuse, but they're they're not part of a native ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So basically, we use those pastures. They're they're a small minority of our land, but we use those pastures when things get difficult in the other pastures. Uh, We don't want to overgraze the native grasses because that damages them. So we can move the animals onto those pastures and it doesn't really hurt them until until we get the rain and the native grasses start going again. So you brought up the topic of the controlled burns and American Indians were connected with the land for centuries, obviously, and controlled burns were actually an effective way to manage the land and to keep it healthy and ready for new growth. I live near a nature park myself and on occasion there are these controlled burns and the people in the surrounding areas, many claiming to be environmentalists, um, get all up in arms upset that there are people interfering with nature. (laughs) And when I dare to mention that it's actually good for the environment, people look at me like I'm crazy. So folks, please take note. Don't sound like a silly head when the topic of controlled burns comes up. Let's listen and learn. So please do tell us about how these controlled burns work and why they're good for the land. As you said, Native people have been burning the land for 10,000 years. That frequency only increased through time. In the Choctaw homeland, for example, almost every different ecotype in our area was created as a result of people managing it. So the tall grass prairie, like we talked about, the savanna, the mixed woods, the longleaf pine forest, none of those would have existed if it weren't for people burning them regularly for centuries. The same thing for southeastern Oklahoma. The native landscape here is meant to be burned about every three years or so. 
if that doesn't happen, we've got enough rain here. It just grows up in this viney, thorny thicket. It's <laughs> yes. like we've got a few places on our land that are so thick, you, you can't crawl through on your belly. <laughs> so that's not really the most useful habitat type for, for birds or animals or a bison, of course. With the burn, it resets everything. So, you know, it'll burn through an area. And if it's grass, it takes it down to black soil. You know, if it's trees, it'll take out the understory. It'll burn up the leaves. It'll burn up any little plants that are in that area. And when that happens, the plants reset. So you've got the thatch removed from the ground. You've got this black soil. So it heats up faster than places where it's a foot deep thatch, which allows the plants to germinate earlier in the season. When plants germinate, when the palatable grasses and forbs germinate like that, they have higher protein content than anywhere else because those new shoots have a lot of resources from the roots. So when that happens, traditionally the animals would move into those areas. That's one of the reasons that people used to burn because they'd create this great forage and then the animals would move in and then they could hunt the animals over an extended period of time. When those plants get clipped off, um, they regrow again. The new shoots have nutrients too. If the animals are still in the area and eat them again, that starts to deplete the resources in the root. So the plants don't come up very fast anymore. That's one of their survival mechanisms. Yeah. When that happens, then you get non-palatable plants moving and come up in the area because the competition's removed. So we're talking things like ragweed, goat weed, stuff like that. Things that most ranchers consider weeds. They're part of the natural process. When those things came up in the past, they're not palatable to the bison, so the bison would move on to another area and that land would rest for a couple of years until it burned again and the grasses came back. Or I should say until the grasses came back and outcompeted those things and burned again. It's usually the way it happened. So there are ranchers who are setting up a similar practice on their land. Um, also the Nature Conservancy does it. It's called the patch burn grazing technique. They burn an area. They may not even have any fences, but they'll burn like a quarter of their land and the animals just flock there for a year. And then they burn a different quarter the next year and this part rests and they just go around their land like that. <laughs> that helps the land to be really diverse. So it's it's good for lots of different animals, lots of different plants. It's it's more like it was in the past. And so you've talked before about how, you know, the nutrients that come from the ground and obviously feeding the animals. So Talk about that a little bit more. I, I think it's interesting how different times in the buffalo's cycle of life, there's different times when different nutrients must come up from the ground. And obviously the controlled burns helps with that. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Like I keep talking about in a, a healthy grassland ecosystem, there are all of these different species of plants. And every single one of them basically farms microorganisms through its roots. And some of them are generalists, but some of them are specific. There's something like 10 million different species of microorganisms in a teaspoon of soil I've read before. And of course, most of them are unnamed, but these plants know what they are and they farm them with their roots. Plants take in carbon dioxide, they take in um, sunlight and they produce sugars and different types of compounds. Some of those help the plants to grow, but a lot of them they put into the soil through their roots called exudates. And then that attracts these microbes. The microbes do different things for the plants. They might help protect it from predators. They might create these fibrous networks in the soil that then bring in all these nutrients to the plants much more efficiently than just the roots on their own. But the plants take that and they work with the particular seasonality that matches what the bison need, the, at least the plants that the bison eat. So an example would be, you know, some of the prairie grasses like little blue stem. Um, if it's burned recently or if it comes up in the spring, it's got really high concentrations of protein in it. That's just what the animals need during that season because the, the cows are getting ready to calf. So they're building new baby bison tissue. So they need lots of protein. Mm -hmm. They'll calve and then the season goes on. And as it does, the protein content and the native grasses starts to decrease and the carbohydrate content starts to go up. So that happens right in line with the animals needs to put on reserves for winter. Basically, they start putting on fat in the fall because the plants are designed for that. And that will help them carry through to the, the next spring when they need the high protein again. I'm just floored by that. Nature. It's amazing. You talked about little blue stem earlier. Tell us more about this grass and, and why it's ideal for these savannas of Oklahoma. Little blue stem was one of the dominant ground covers in our area, like the specific types of soil that we have on our land are associated with that plant. And its its strategy is, is long term. You know, it 
it grows slowly, um, but it's there for the long haul. It'll live for years and years and years if given the right conditions. You know, it's got these seeds that have these fluff on it so they can go through the wind a certain amount of distance but they also get stuck in the coats of bison along with other types of seeds somebody did their dissertation on how many seeds get stuck in the average bison coat. <laughs> how does one measure that <laughs> you count them you count them they found it was 1200 seeds so you think about these animals they're migratory you know they may go for hundreds of miles and they shed that coat once a year so they could be taking those seeds hundreds of miles from where they started and then once one of those little blue stem seeds gets put in the ground, it'll sit there until conditions are right for it to grow. The first thing that it does is it puts down its roots in the soil. So it, it may germinate and may be there in the soil like an inch tall for several years. Like you wouldn't even see it out in a pasture until the conditions come right for it to grow the top part of the plant. So it'll send up those shoots in the spring, you know, high in protein like we were talking about. But it sends its roots down even deeper. You know, those roots for little blue stem will go five or six feet. Some of the other native grasses, like eastern gamma grass, they'll go down like nine feet. They wow. go way down in the soil and they farm those microbes like we were talking about. And they put carbon in the soil by sharing the exudates with the microbes. So they're protecting the soil from drought, obviously, by putting carbon material in it. But they also have these fibrous roots that hold the soil together for flooding. And they also air, help aerate the soil so it absorbs water more efficiently. And the top of the plant is designed in such a way like, you know, in Oklahoma, we have these torrential rains. It's designed to intercept those raindrops so that they hit the ground slowly so that the ground can absorb it instead of it just running off. So this plant's designed for all of those different things. And then, like I was saying earlier, as the season wears on, the protein content goes down and the carbohydrates go up. So that provides winter reserves, it provides fat for the bison and the other grazing animals. Fantastic. I mean, when you can't hear that and not think that this is all interconnected, it's totally interconnected. So, and the bison love it, right? They love the little blue stem. They do, especially if it's, you know, either new growth or if it's been burned over recently, they love it. The thing about it and a lot of the prairie grasses is if they don't get burned or grazed, they will start to get this thatch layer and then they don't do very well. They can't grow in their own shade. Mm -hmm. And then shrubs and trees and all of these things move in and the grasses go away. So that, that's another reason why you need fire. For sure. And I've loved hearing about the lessons you've learned along the way with both raising the bison and doing the controlled burns and working the land. So what have you learned about the balance of both the land and the bison together? So... A lot of times when people hear how many bison we have, we have 13 bison on 160 acres. They're like, well, that's not enough. You guys aren't really serious ranchers, <laughs> but we are. I beg to differ. Sorry. <laughs> that's how many animals our particular piece of land will take. If we had 15 animals, then the trend, the trajectory would be the other way. We'd be damaging the land instead of having it rebound. Mm -hmm. So that, that's about right for our particular piece of ground right now as we improve it. Um, our forage capacity is going up. Um, our forage capacity has actually improved about 50% over the last four years just by changing the management and focusing on the native plants. Mm -hmm. So that was equivalent to adding 90 acres of land to our farm by doing nothing other than just changing the management. Interesting. It's a lot of work trying to balance it all and figure it all out. It's been a lot of trial and error, as we mentioned earlier. And that's one cool thing about the blog post, too, is you go, it, the further you go down into you know, the months prior to today, you'll see some of those things that, you know, as you and I were talking about preparing for this conversation, you said, well, really the, the seed planting that you had done, the seed, bombs. the seed bombs, you were like, that didn't work out the way we wanted it to. But a lot of the other things that we have done have worked. So um, you'll find that in the blog as we go. The blog's there for conversation, so we leave up the old blog post, yes. even if we've learned something totally different. We usually try to put a disclaimer at the bottom, so... It doesn't mislead people if we've learned oh, something sure. new later. Yeah, so they don't go down the same path. But it's all still there <laughs> for people to see. Absolutely. So as we're talking about this beautiful land, and it is beautiful, you know, there's, if you're standing in the kitchen of, we're in your home right now, standing in the kitchen, you can look out these two different windows and you just see beautiful trees, pasture. And I noticed the fence is right there. So the buffalo can actually come pretty close to the house as well, right? While you're washing dishes or whatever. Yes, they can. <laughs> what, it's just beautiful. So um, why don't you tell our listeners about the history of the land itself and how you came to purchasing the land? Sure. This land's located in the heart of Choctaw Nation. 
Um, before Choctaw people were here, there were other tribes that called this land home. From the artifacts here, we know that there were bison hunters here 6,000 years ago. Um, they left their spear points on these same hills where our bison walk today. There were groups of Caddo ancestors that lived here about 1,500 years ago. They had settlements and houses all over these hills here on our land. Um, there were people living here just right before European contact. And then, you know, colonization happened. So this area is a place where the uh, Quapaw, where the Caddo, where the Kiowa and the Osage either lived or, or passed through over time. It's on land that was ceded by Quapaw Nation to the United States and then from the United States to Choctaw Nation. Um, this land was allotted to a young Choctaw woman. I think she was about 20 years old or so, just before statehood. And we don't think she lived here. There's not a lot of evidence that she did. But um, it's never been subdivided since that time. It's always been the same acreage as her allotment. Um, you know, we don't really feel like we own the land. We're paying on it, obviously, trying to pay it off. But uh, we feel more like, or at least I feel more like I belong to the land instead of the other way around. Totally. And by the way, since this land has virtually been untouched, do you ever find artifacts out here? We do. Um, you know, we, we treat them respectfully when we find them, you know, usually we just photograph them and put them back. Um, you know, we'll, we'll show them to different people so they can learn about them, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's a connection with the people who used to live here. When we built our house, you know, we recognize this is the homeland of these other tribes, but we want it to be Choctaw too. So when the, the ground was leveled before they put in the foundation, we actually took soil from the Choctaw homeland from an area where there were lots of Choctaw people living in the past, and we spread it underneath our foundation. So the house we're in, it's, it's Choctaw land, too. Yeah. What kind of artifacts have you found? Probably arrowheads? Arrowheads. I think Ian mm -hmm. found a bit of a, what, a, what one of those? We found, I found a gorget one time, which is this basically stone piece of jewelry with two holes drilled in it that would have gone on a necklace. Oh. And it was weird how I found it. I went out to look at the, the animals to check on them, and it was sitting on top of the grass. Like, I guess they'd kicked it out of the grass or something, but it was <laughs> on top of the grass. So, you know, that's a, a special artifact. So we worked with the medicine person to rebury that respectfully where yeah. it came from. So that, you know, that's the way that that should be done. You know, I say artifacts, but I probably should be saying items that belong to people who previously lived here. Um before we move to our next topic, I have to ask, you once told me that both of you do all of this work out here yourselves, and you fund and work the land on your own. Is there a listener, if there's a listener out there that's willing to come to the farm and donate their time to help on occasion or to donate some funds to support your efforts, is that something that you would consider accepting? Mostly what we're trying to do is to create conversation. Like, it, that's really what we want to do. We're, we're not really necessarily looking for donations for sure or for people to, to come out and do manual labor but if you want to talk with us about it or, or share knowledge that that's really what we're here for so something else i was thrilled to learn about is that you also have two choctaw ponies on the farm when i was driving up one of them came to greet me so sweet the one with the blue eyes um, and for my listeners, if you haven't heard about our tribe's ponies, you're in for a treat. And these Choctaw ponies have an interesting connection with Amy, so we'll talk about that in just a bit. But first, why don't you tell us about the history of horses in this country and where our ponies came into play? So horses developed here and in Eurasia. You know, they're one of the animals. We've been talking about the Pleistocene, the last ice age. They're one of the animals that lived here at that time. Um, there's evidence that they were hunted for food at that time. You know, they're... they're some tribes have stories to the contrary. Most of the evidence from archaeology suggests that the horses went extinct at the end of the Ice Age in the United States, in the Americas, but they continued on in Asia and Europe. Um, they were ultimately domesticated in Eastern Europe, and people began to ride them. Choctaws got reintroduced to the horse through the Spanish conquistadors in the 1500s. Um, the most significant battle that we had was the Battle of Mabila in 1540, um, Choctaws and probably some of the other Muscogean speaking tribes had seen DeSoto cutting a swath of suffering through the southeast and decided to put a stop to it. So I you know, may not have time to go into all the battle, but basically um, the natives had DeSoto inside of our town. And when DeSoto acted like he did, he took a, a native man who was being insubordinate and stabbed him in the back with a sword. When that happened, 
we sent a barrage of arrows towards the Spanish and chased the Spanish outside the walls of the town and looked like we were easily going to defeat them. Um, we rescued the slaves that they'd taken from other tribes. We stole their baggage. We stole some of their, a few of their horses. But then when the Spanish got outside the walls of the town, the, the Choctaws chased them on foot. Mm. And the Spanish got on their horses and swung back around. And, you know, we'd never faced the horse on the battlefield. It was the day's equivalent of a tank. So they rode down the people that had chased them and then eventually re-entered the town and managed to annihilate everybody in the town. Um, there are accounts that when the the last Choctaw men had fallen, their women picked up their weapons and just kept right on fighting until there was nobody left. In the Spanish chroniclers, the people who were you know from the Spanish side, they said that they had intended to set up an economita system in the southeast, basically to make servants, feudal servants, out of all the native people and set European lords up over them. But when they fought the Choctaw at that battle, they realized that we love freedom so much and we're such brave people that that system wouldn't work there. So we lost the battle, but you know, completely changed the tide of what was happening in the Southeast. The horse was a key part of that. They're the reason that we lost the battle. Um, Choctaw people ultimately got our own horses from the Caddo in the 1690s. And at first, like 12,000 years ago, we used them for food quite a bit, but soon we started to ride them and realized their real economic benefit. The Choctaw name for horse is um, Isoba, which comes from Isi Holba, that means like a deer. The deer was the most important animal economically for Choctaw, so calling the horse that's really saying something about its importance. Choctaws rode horses um, at full gallop, apparently. We didn't trot with them. We rolled them at full gallop. And in the 1700s, we redid our whole trail system, which was set up for foot traffic to accommodate horses. Basically, we widened it. As time passed in the early 1800s, they were a major part of our economy. Choctaws took on a cattle economy. Horses were a part of that. And by the, the eve of the Trail of Tears, when a child was born, they would give that child a mare and a colt, the male and female pig and cow, and all the things that they would need to set up farms. So when they became marriageable age, they would have their own herds. The, the horse, the Choctaw horse, was there on the Trail of Tears. Um, some of them had to be left behind, but some of them came with Choctaw people. There are accounts in some of the camps, the, the winter was so harsh that some of the horses actually froze standing up. I think about 2,000 horses died, have been recorded on the Trail of Tears. Of course, more Choctaw people than that died on the Trail of Tears. But ultimately, they were brought to Indian Territory, and they helped the tribe to reestablish its cattle-based economy. You know, the Choctaw Pony was a part of that. Um, and, you know, it's it was kind of after statehood, after, you know, colonization continued, the horse was kind of pushed to the side. The Choctaw Pony was. It wasn't really appreciated. A number of the horses were running wild on Blackjack Mountain, not far from here. And they were part of land that was going to be um, used for timber, and the owners of the land intended to kill all of them. So an individual named Bryant Rickman, who had known about these ponies and got introduced to them through a Choctaw man, um, dedicated his retirement to saving them. And he, he did. He ultimately saved about 400 of them. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are a few families here and there that still have their horses from back in the day, too, including a few in Mississippi. But the biggest bulk of them came from that man's actions to save them. God bless him. And and what are the names of the two that you have? Um, one's Nenak Tommy and the other one's Hobbley. And what do those names mean? Nenak Tommy means, um, means shines at night. It's interesting um, how we how he got that name. It's just that um, one uh, one night we seen a horse. We seen something across the field, and um, it, it was all shiny and everything. But then we realized it was the shape of a horse, and pretty much his coat, especially when the moon is out, it it reflects the light of the moon, and it turned. It, he gets really it gets really shining. That's amazing. I love that. And so that's how he got his name is um, is Nenok Tommy, which means shines at night. Yeah. And Hobbley, <laughs> he he's a sweeter he's a sweeter one of the two, um, but uh, he he likes to kick. That's the word meaning is kick. <laughs> and how he got that name is mainly anytime he was happy or something, he would literally kick the ground, oh. or he was kicking for his food, or he he was just constantly kicking the ground for some reason. So that's so cute. So that's how he got his name is Hobbley. <laughs> Loves to kick. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's so cute. You talked about Blackjack Mountain, and by the way, in Native Choctaw Season 1, Episode 7, I interviewed Francine Locke Bray, and 
her chief was the one that had some of those horses on Blackjack Mountain for a while, right? Mm -hmm. um, and she lives at the foothills of Blackjack Mountain, and, and she talks further in that episode about the Choctaw ponies. And so listeners, if you haven't heard already, be sure to check that out. But here's the kicker about the whole thing. Now, Amy, you have a personal connection to these ponies, correct? Yes. Well, um, I found I found this out through through um, through, through Francine also. Is that um, is that my my grandfather? He had he was taking care of the chief's um, uh, chief's horses at that time. Mm -hmm. So basically, whenever they were released, I, I'm guessing he was one of the ones that released them. I'm not sure about that part. But what the interesting thing is is that they found the bloodline that my um, um, that my grandfather had taken care of, and they're still the same bloodline as the two horses that we have today. So that's amazing. <laughs> it's it just totally comes full circle. <laughs> yes, it does. I mean, there's like a connection to it. So. Wow. The, the same bloodline as the, the early Spanish Mustangs. So some of them have blue eyes like you were mm -hmm. talking about. That's a characteristic. Some of them have dark stripes on their legs, and some of them have a stripe down their back. They all go back to that early breed. Oh, my mm -hmm. goodness. And I remember Francine telling me that it's truly um, tested via DNA, correct? Mm -hmm. So they're truly trying to figure out which are that bloodline from the Spaniards. So fascinating. You wrote that maintaining the bloodline of 300 years ago, the Choctaw ponies are today some of the purest Spanish Mustangs in existence. In recent years, horses from this rescued herd have won a number of national endurance races against much larger quarter horses and thoroughbreds. I was shocked when I read that because they're so small. You know, they're just little ponies. Not small like a Shetland pony, but they're smaller than the typical horse. Mm -hmm. They're they're tough too. I mean, not our horses, but we've seen other Choctaw ponies get their legs stuck. And if that was any other horse, it would have broken its leg. Yeah. But mm -hmm. The Choctaw pony <laughs> just got itself free and took off and it was oh fine. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> tough guys, man. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for sharing about the ponies. It's truly, you know, what a treasure that you guys get to have some. And I just, I was so excited when I saw them coming up to my car. So you all know this wouldn't be a traditional native Chalk Talk episode without my digging into some of the stories and history of Amy and Ian's own ancestors. So Amy, let's start with you and about your maiden name, which I think is interesting. My maiden name is um, Iachabi. And um, pretty much it's more like a, a contraction of a name. Um, Ia means to go. Mitcha means to and. And Abby means to go, go and kill, but they had put that into one, into one phrase, into one word, and, and um, made it chubby. So they took out the M-I from the Mitch up, which means and. So it means goes and kills. It means goes and kills. Wow. And that's, and usually um, how, how, how that name came, came across is that one of my ancestors must have shown his, must have shown his bravery and his tactics on the battlefield. Yeah. And that's how he got his name. And so therefore my dad, he he's the full blood Choctaw among um among my parents. My my mother, she's a Choctaw Chicksaw Seminole Creek. Okay. But um let's see, uh, but as far as anything, um my dad he's a full blood chick Choc uh, Choctaw, and he's actually from around this area, so. Oh, he is. Okay. Yes. And he speaks Choctaw fluently, yes, he, right? Yes, he was. Okay. A, he's a first language speaker. And there's not many of those left, of course, today. No, there's not, unfortunately. But basically, his his um, his story was pretty is pretty interesting itself. So. Yeah. And his his mother. Um, let's see, his mother. Um, whenever she was alive, she always used to speak um, Choctaw within her household. Her and her husband, and uh, base, but how you could tell that was mainly through the broken English that she would speak to us. Um, whenever she, whenever we went to we went to go visit her, so yeah. But she was always speaking Choctaw whenever, and pretty much my I think it's like my dad could have understood her and speak with her. My my aunt, she she was the baby of the family. She could understand what she was saying. So. She could not. She could. Oh, she could. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have the Chickasaw language and the Choctaw language obviously are mm -hmm. kind of sister languages. They're very similar. And so it's interesting that your mom and your dad could speak to each other and still kind of understand each other, right? Well, my mother, she wasn't, um, let's see, whenever she was very young, she said that she she used to be able to speak Chickasaw because she was around it, but I think she had forgotten it okay. whenever she got gotten, had gotten older. But however, my grandmother, she was a, uh, a full-blood Chickasaw herself. And she could speak the language, 
And so she used to tell me that a full blood Choctaw and a full blood Chickasaw, um, well, fluent speaker of, of both tribes, could talk with one another and still understand what they were what they were talking about. Wow, they're I that mean, close. Came, yes, they are. Yeah. I used to see my pa my dad and my grandmother do that. So oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they could still figure it out. I mean that makes total sense. Yes. And you mentioned to me that you love to sing the Choctaw hymns. Yes, um, my my mother, even though she's she is um, she is Chickasaw, she um, her father was um, was a minister within this area, yeah. and so during that time she learned how to how to sing the Choctaw hymns, mm -hmm. and uh, basically that's uh, my brother, sister, and I had grown up um, singing these hymns. That's wonderful. And do you do you do that now? Do you go into the churches on Sundays and? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes, we still do. And don't you also have a connection with the Light Horsemen? Yes, as a matter of fact, we do. Um, let's see, it was given to, I had seen a newspaper article that a friend of mine who had, who had also known my, um, my, my father's family, um, um, my dad's family, uh, let's see, but she had given me a newspaper article um, sta uh, stating about this, um, I can't remember his name, but I remember seeing HB inside the article. Yeah. But he was he was running he was he was on the trail of this of this criminal, and but his horse was giving out, and um, he needed a fresh horse. So what he had done is is that he yelled out to the next uh, the next homestead that he had seen that he was needing um, a, um, a horse, except instead of saying it in English, he he was yelling it out in Choctaw. And so by the time he got to the homestead, he had a fresh horse waiting for him so he could pursue his, keep pursuing his chase wow, to, yeah. um, for the criminal. So <laughs> The Choctaw support system is strong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. So I'm guessing that, um, that with the Light Horseman, um, which, is the, um, which was the, uh, the um, I guess you could say, equivalent to the to nowadays um, police force, mm -hmm. um, except he was for the Choctaws, but basically... Um, that 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 um actually he was being supported by the people around him so yeah wow that's fantastic I love that story so um, basically that was that was found in a newspaper article so within some stuff so <laughs> yeah for sure I'm glad that we have those you know newspapers dot com places that we can go to mm -hmm. research some of those stories because sometimes we may not know otherwise so for people who are researching their Native American heri heritage that's a great place to go to. Just mm -hmm. type in your family member's name. Sometimes you'll find something in there. And Ian, how about you? Where did you grow up? What inspired you to want to delve into your Choctaw history? I grew up in Independence, Missouri. And when I was seven years old, um, my uncle and I were at a zoo, actually, and we came across this flint in the ground, Winterset Chirp. And he picked it up and said, let's make some arrowheads. So you know, we took it to his house, and he started... Uh, working with me to chip arrowheads out of that. And I, I just caught fire for learning indigenous culture yeah. and, and Choctaw history from the time I was seven and found anybody who could teach me um, new things, you know, either in the family or outside of the family. And ultimately that brought me back to the Choctaw nation. Um, my family, my great grandfather who was Choctaw left Mississippi in 1882. And he spent, you know, a lot of time with my grandfather, and I spent a lot of time with him. So I learned a lot of family stories and lore through my grandfather. He had all kinds of interesting stories. Oh, yes, he did. You gave me a little taste of it last time we all talked, and I was just cracking up. Actually, do tell. There was the one about the dynamite. We have to hear about that. Sure. So he grew up in a, a time and place that was different from today. He said, you know, it, it wasn't... It wasn't unusual for a storekeeper to sell a 10-year-old kid a, a carton of dynamite. <laughs> the so Wild he, West. <laughs> he and his brother, when they were teenagers, got a job clearing the dirt roads in their area. And they were using dynamite charges to blow the stumps out of the road. And they were working their way along. And they came up to this house. And <clears throat> a man came out of the house. And he looked at what they are doing. He said, you're not doing that right. Let me show you how to do that. <clears throat> so, again, they're teenagers. And he's a full-grown man. He takes a lot of dynamite and puts it under the stump, sets it off, and you know it gets the stump out, sure enough, but it flies through the air and flies through the back window of his car that's sitting in front of his house. And he didn't say a word. He just walked back in the house and shut the door. <laughs> so much pride. Let me show y'all how to do this. I'm going to go destroy my own car now. Oh, my gosh. 
<laughs> there's there's another one about the dynamite, right? Yeah, it sounds like they played with dynamite all the time, but but they didn't. They were responsible. But this was um, this was not my my grandfather. This was somebody else. But he was out fishing in one of the streams, and they were using dynamite to fish. So they would light the dynamite and put it in the stream in a place where they knew the water was deep. And of course, they would use that to create a concussion that would stun the fish and make them float to the surface. So he lit his charge and looked up and here comes the game warden in his boat. So he goes up on the bank and hides in the brush and the game warden comes that way. And of course he's right over that deep hole, right when the charge goes off and it blows his boat up, <laughs> but it, it doesn't hurt the guy. Like he's, he's just stunned and he sits there in the shallow water for a minute and then he stands up and scans all around and he can't see this person who's hiding in the brush and he just walks back up the river the way he came. <laughs> best oh my goodness I, I think those people definitely lived life back in that time <laughs> see and because we don't allow anybody to play with dynamite anymore we're missing out on all these great stories now <laughs> <laughs> what a time that must have been oh then there's your great grandpa's wife who was going into labor and what happened with that story she was going into labor um, they lived in east texas at the time and they lived in a rural farmstead so her husband my great yeah, my great-grandfather. No, great-great-grandfather. Uh, he went to get the doctor, and he was playing, you know, he was playing poker at a, a local liquor establishment. So my grandfather said, my wife's in labor. Can you come help her deliver? And the doctor said, yeah, I'll be along after the game's over. So my grandfather took his pistol and stuck it in the doctor's face and said, no, you're coming right now. So he did, and he <laughs> delivered my great-grandmother, and she was fine. <laughs> Too bad we can't handle things that way today. <laughs> Um, and then uh, along the um, lines of pregnancy, there was a Polish woman who had given birth. And what happened in that story? Yeah, this was one of my grandfather's stories, somebody that he'd known. Um, there was uh, a Polish woman, and she was, you know, their neighbor. And they saw her out working in the field, you know, doing heavy manual labor without her husband. They said, well, where's your husband? And she said, well, I, I gave birth last night, and he got tired, so he's inside resting. And, you know, here she is, the one who actually gave birth out there working in the field. So, wow. you know, time passed and later on they saw her out there working in the field by herself again and they said, well, where's your husband? And she said, well, he, he's homesick. They said, well, do you want us to get a doctor? And she said, no, he's plenty old enough to die. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He died. <laughs> no love lost there. No. <laughs> Man, what a hard time period it must have been back then. Wild, wild west. Some hard mm -hmm. things and some things that were amazing in terms yes. of spirit of community and what people got to do and self-reliance. Yes. Like Indeed. I say, I, I think he lived more life by the time he was 20 than I have in my life at, to this point. And, and your grandpa also told, told some stories about some crazy neighbors, right? Yeah, he had crazy neighbors. Um, they, would, they would do things like sing out. You know, they would take their showers out in the rainstorm. They'd be out there singing at the top naked? of their lungs naked while it's raining <laughs> on and stuff like that. <laughs> they had, this is, you know, my grandfather's story. Um, they had this house and, you know, it was located up on pure stones and it had this slat floor. And the pigs used to like to get under it in the daytime because it was cool. So their parents left and they said, well, let's take this water and boil it on the stove and pour it on the pigs. So they did that. They boiled it and poured it through the slat floor. And the pigs freaked out and shook the house and almost knocked it down off, <laughs> oh, off the foundation. <laughs> Those poor pigs. <laughs> what else does your grandpa have for us? <laughs> you know, they used to go barefoot quite a bit. And he and his brother were out in the yard barefoot at, at their grandmother's house. And she was a Choctaw who'd come from Mississippi, too. And they have these giant centipedes down there. They're like eight, nine inches long, bright colored. And one of them ran across his brother's barefoot and it stung him. So he was in a lot of pain and their grandmother saw that and they were, you know, she was out in the yard with them and she snatched up a chicken that was nearby and wrung its neck and split it in half with an ax and then put it on his foot to dry out the poison. Whoa, smart. Whoa. Grandma's got you. <laughs> I don't wow. know if it was the shock of, wow, there's half a chicken on my foot. Maybe it distracted him. It didn't hurt his head. I don't know. <laughs> that is nuts. Wow. All these little remedies that you wouldn't know about that people knew about at one point. Any other interesting stories you want to share about either of your families? I'll share one more. Okay. You know, it's one of my grandfather's stories. They were 
they were having this owl that kept visiting their house in the evening. And obviously that's a bad omen. So they loaded up the shotgun and they're like, okay, we're going to get that owl when it comes back. And they put it on a, some pegs up above the front door. So they were waiting for that owl to come back. Well, the next day their cousin comes by and he's standing there in the front door and he's talking to him and just absentmindedly, he reaches up and pulls the trigger on the gun, and almost blew the corner off the house. <laughs> careful how you pull the gun down <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> wild west well these are fantastic stories thank you both for sharing and i hope we're showing honor to your ancestors funny as they might be by keeping their memories alive and before we close remind us how we can find your website and the blog posts about nanawaya farm um, your book and anything else you'd like for us to be able to access I'll see our our our, um, our blog post can be be um, uh, is located on nanawaya dot com, which is spelled n a n a w a y a dot com. Um, let's see, and um, let's see, the book is found. It can be found at um, let's see, the Choctaw Nation um, Historical Museum in Tashkahoma or or in the Hashik. Um, Gift shop in the cultural center here in, in Durant. Great. Um, let's see. And is there anything else I'm missing? I think that's it. I think that's, that's it. I think you covered it. Good, because now I need to run over there to Tushkahoma and grab me one of those books. <laughs> 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 and finally, are there any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Let's see. I would just like to say, just try something new every once in a while. Um, the re. Let's see. I had grown up all my life um, uh, with animals, and uh, basically it goes from cats, dogs, see, uh, rabbits. <laughs> this is long. So, okay. and uh, one time Ian had a dream. Uh, Ian had told me he had a dream of um, raising a buffalo. I'm like, okay. I thought, well, let's ra let's raise a buffalo. So that was my, my trying That's something. The start of it. <laughs> that was the start of it, wow. and that was my trying something new. So, and it yeah. led to. It, um, and the fact that we Buffalo. had we bought a place, our first farm, and it came with cows. Exactly. And our neighbor said, hey, your cows are getting out. I'm like, really? <laughs> so I went and I found the spot where they're getting out the fence. They were walking half a mile to the highway and then coming back and getting back in before we got home. So, are you serious? Yeah. Yes. Those are smart cows. So we sold the cows and uh, put up new fence. And, you know, since Amy was approving, well, why not put up bison fence and get some bison instead of some cows? So that's how we started. And that's how it happens. That's how it happens. Okay, let's do it. That's fantastic. I love that you were willing to take a chance on something new and exciting. And like you said, look at where it's led you. And now you have a beautiful buffalo robe sitting behind you. And you know so much about these animals after years of studying them and the land and all that. So thank you. I appreciate those words of wisdom. Ian, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my interests when I was growing up weren't like, they didn't fit real well. They didn't mesh real well with, you know, the Western economic system. So people advised me to find a job that was lucrative, find a career that was lucrative, and then do what I enjoyed on the weekends. And I did exactly the opposite. I, I took what I'm passionate about and made it into my career. And as a result, you know, it's stereotype, but it's true. You never work a day. Like if you're doing something you love, you can push yourself to the very limits of your ability. And it, it's fun. You're getting to do something that, that you've always wanted to do. So that would be my advice. Find something that you love to do and make it your career. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I love that. I will definitely take that to heart myself, and I hope our listeners will do as well. Yako Ki to you both for being here with me today and for sharing so much and opening your home um, to myself and the crew that's here today. Um, we've really enjoyed getting to know you and your land and your animals. So Thank you. It's an honor well, to be you. on your program. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.